All right, here we go. Reggie Wright Jr., welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me back, Black. No doubt, man. We shook things up last time. <laughs> you know, let's, uh, let's talk about some more stuff this time. Cool. So, you know, I want to talk about, I want to start out with Compton a little bit. Okay. And kind of the backstory. Most people these days think of Compton as an African-American city. But it didn't start out that way, did it? No, not at all. Um, like I said, uh, uh, you know, George W. Bush uh, went to Compton College, Compton Community College. Uh, he did something in the summer, uh, a little intern, and he stayed in the Santa Fe Gardens. But we're talking about the 50s or the 60s. Um, but my parents, like I said on the first interview, I believe, uh, my parents bought a home in 72 there. And it was probably 50% uh, black and white at, at that time. Well, a little bit of Mexicans, um, I'm sure, had a small percentage. But now the demographic is, woo. So woo. what exactly happened? What, what caused all the white people to start leaving Compton? <laughs> well, white folks, I mean, white people, white young kids say the black folks. <laughs> but just the, the, the demographic, you know, all of us was moving, all of our parents were moving from Watts, the, the projects, the housing projects, you know, the Jordan Downs, the Pueblos, the... Uh, Imperial Courts, um, uh, what's some other ones over there? But you know, the, the different housing projects that, that's in Watts. And they were starting to make a little money, had little jobs, making $30,000 a year, whatever. And they were starting to buy homes. I remember my parents bought their home in, um, in 72 for $28,000. And then, so now you had homes in Cerritos and Bellflower that were starting to sell for like 50000 or whatever. And so white people just moving into uh, you know, a little nicer areas. And back then, you're talking about, you know, the 60s, early 70s, there were no gangs. No, no, no. The yeah. gangs, they, they were kind of starting the crib. They were really crews, the Crenshaws and stuff like that. Um, and you have to go to my boy Street TV, uh, Alex Alonzo, to get the history on that, or our podcast. Matter of fact, we just did a show on uh, a podcast that Alex uh, Alonzo from Street TV Gangs and, and myself and Mob James do every Wednesday mm -hmm. on a podcast. And we just talked about the history of, of when the Crips started and then later on when the blood started and the pyro. So on one of the episodes, we did a whole series on that. Okay. And, and back then, you know, you had two family homes. You oh, had yeah. the mother and the father, the whole single family, mother raising the kids. That, that wasn't around back then. Well, that started in. Well, the people that was fortunate enough to move to Compton did. Yeah. And unfortunately, you still have some people in the uh, still living in the housing, the, the you know the housing uh, the projects mm -hmm. that you know some of my friends um, was raised mainly by a single family, which was generally the mother. Okay, I mean the Crips didn't start in Compton. The Crips started in L.A. L.A. Yes. How did it start to creep over into Compton? Hmm. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, okay. uh, but I swear we just did an episode on that on Gangster Chronicles on our podcast, and um, they they explained that. Mob James and um, and Alex got real deep into that about how that started. Okay, and were there Mexicans in Compton during that time? There was some, um, for lack of coming off as being prejudiced, they were mainly the uh, the worker types, mm -hmm. you know the. Um, we call them border butlers now or something like that. That type of, you know, family, hard, hard working family, yeah, but not. Blue collar family. Yeah, blue collar family, yeah. Okay. And were there Mexican, Mexican gangs around that time or not really? Well, you know, you had the zoo suits and all of that, if you know the history of that. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they really started uniting. Uh, but I'm no historian on gangs, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> okay. But at one point, the gang situation started to, to get bigger. I mean, when you were a kid, was it already in full swing? Uh, I started noticing it. It wasn't like the drive-by shootings and stuff like that. But when I was a kid, that would be the mid-70s to the late-70s. And so um, we saw the Parus and, and the Crips fighting a little bit, but they were mainly fighting. You didn't have this drive-by shooting and this, this sh shoot em up stuff like, you know, like we know of today. It mainly just fights in your yard where four or five guys was jumping, you know, a dude from another set that, you know, was wearing blue or something like that. That's, that's all you saw for the most part. You know, before there was crack, there was PCP. Sure, yeah. Angel sure. dust, we used to call it Angel back Angel dust, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
And that was pretty much running the drug trades around Compton, pretty much, right? Yeah, they all were. They all got on that. Um, well, yeah, around Compton. Now my dad in that era, where well, they were all hooked on Red Devils. What's that? Um, there was some type of pills they were taking. And the upper. Uh, yeah. yeah. And most of his friends, and that's why he said the only reason he probably never got on heroin, heroin, was because he was scared of needles. Mm. Uh, but that's what you know in the early seventies and. And later on was the, the drug of choice. Okay. And then crack started coming around. Crack came in the 80s. Ronald Reagan, I always say. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then that's when the gang started to really ramp up because now they had money. They had money, mainly for territory now, to push their, their crack cocaine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you were in, in high school when, when crack started to hit, or more like junior high? Uh, I graduated from high school in 84. Okay. So um, okay, it was that, out there, but I mean, in my law, well, later when I started working, I started working in a jail for the city of Compton in 85, and, and it was rapid then. I mean, <laughs> it was on every street corner. 85, the 90, crack cocaine was bad. I mean, it was affected all of our homes. I mean, if you didn't, if you was black and you had somebody that was in your family that was hooked on crack and still have um, issues from it today. Yeah. yeah, crack cocaine really messed up the black families. Yeah, I mean, I interviewed Freeway Ricky a bunch of times, actually. Okay. And he was moving literally hundreds of kilos. You were moving 100 kilos a day. You had a dozen crack houses that were making 40000 in profit a day. <laughs> and you had a network of dealers that were moving half a million crack rocks a day. When, when you look at these types of numbers, and this is all, you've laid all this out in your book, it is a staggering amount of drugs. I mean, half a million rocks a day. Like, when you look at that right now, how, how, how do you even come to grips with it? I don't know. It's, it's like, you know, that was just something I stumbled up on, you know. Uh, um, it was only when I really got in prison that I really understood uh, the magnitude. Yeah, they, they dumped it into our communities. I mean, people get mad when you say it, but that's just a fact. Because you right. didn't see crack cocaine or anything, in the other, and it ain't like we had boats. <laughs> we had, how, how was it coming? Well, I mean, they even were. Freeway Ricky at the level that he was at, yeah. he wasn't moving it from out of the country. It, he was too breaking. scared to, yeah. go, to go overseas to go meet with these guys himself. Yeah. Yeah. We were vulnerable in Miami. You know, right. And that was one of the reasons that uh, when they offered me to go out the country that, that I didn't really want to go out the country because uh, I felt so vulnerable. Oh, so your Miami connects were trying to get you to go out of the country? Yeah, yeah. They used to try to get me to go out to, the country. To what country? Uh, Mexico, Colombia. Aha. So he had a connect who had, was a South American guy. Yeah, that, that was good. Colum- or the Colombians, yeah. Yeah, I mean, his guy was um, Oscar Blandon was Nicaraguan. Nicaragua, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, you know, he had a Nicaraguan connect that was literally moving hundreds of kilos okay. to him all the time. He said once the Colombians came, the, the price dropped. Well, I guess once Blandon got in the picture, you were moving up to $3 million of cocaine a day. Well, yeah, it went to another level. Because he, he took it down even even cheaper than what, uh, what Ivan had did. But at the same time, Colombians had also moved into, into the game, too. And what happened with that? Well, the price was going down. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. They started, the Columbia's, okay, they, the they, Columbia they, started undercutting okay. everybody. Those of who I remember coming through the jail system when, because you had the federal task force. You know, now you had city police and federal agents working together. Because federal agents back then was just really book smart mm-hmm. and had all that resource. They needed street cops to go to come into the community and say, okay, this is, this is the major player. This is who we need to be fo- focusing our time on. Well, the... The, the drug traffickers were using the gangs to move the product. Correct. Pretty much. Were you ever busting guys with major quantity? No, I never worked at that level. I have saw it and seen it and no officers that were, but no, I never was at that level. I never was really big into the, the narcotic gang other than at the street level. The okay. guy that's sitting on the corner with 10 or 15 rocks in his pocket and a gun on him and stuff like that. Okay, well, what was the biggest bust that you knew of in Compton while you were working? 
a guy named Fink who Keefe D trying to take credit for it, saying it was his, but it was Fink's dope. Uh, he had 63 uh, kilos and he was moving it. He had an old man driving a camper, you know, and his family, like they were going on a trip, going, going out, you know, because they was moving it back south because that's where you can get more money for your keys at. But they were trying to look like a family. But you know, they had informants, you know, had an informant that said, hey, this old man about to, you know, move about 63, 70 keys across the country. And we stopped them and seized the, seized the, uh, the, the camper and um, the trailer. We was always told it was Fink, but I recently heard in his book, Keepy D trying to take credit like it was his, but I don't believe that. I mean, 63 kilos is a lot, but it's not, oh, no. not very much compared to what you Freeway Ricky. You're the biggest that I know about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, big. Freeway Ricky was doing like daily 100 kilo pickups and, and stuff like that. It was, it was really yeah. ridiculous at that level. He said that at his height, he was moving a half a million rocks a day. Well, rocks, because because you break it down, you, you break know, it you down. It up, you, but when you just when yeah. you think about it, he had like seventeen, like I think like a dozen crack houses and and so forth. It was really a it was a, a bad ec epidemic. But he a hundred kilos is a lot of weight, you know. Vlad. Some of us like to put a little bit of extra on <laughs> how important it was. Not saying he wasn't, but I don't think he was doing that much. At the, you know, a uh, hundred a week, a hundred a day is a lot. That's a lot, especially once you break it down and rock it up. Right. That's a lot. I mean, right. That's why they, they came up with the rock and the, the, the baking soda and all of that to, to stretch it, to make more money. Exactly. If you ever watched the show Snowfall, watch Ricky at the beginning, Snowfall tell you how that, that came up. Right, you know? right. And, you know, Freeway said that. When John passed, um, the only effect that I could think about is that, you know, he stole my story. I thought you got it worked out. Mm -mm. They didn't. Absolutely not. <laughs> Yeah, I just asked him about how he felt about oh, okay. Singleton passing. I thought they got that worked was, out. I believe that. Yeah, he I wasn't. That. He had nothing nice to say about Singleton. It's sad, but you know that's the state that, that we're in. You know, a guy would take your shit and and use it, and uh, don't feel that he's supposed to do nothing for you for it. You know, uh, not even having the courtesy, you know, to say, you know what, man, thanks. It's unfortunate. Um, yeah, because that is pretty much freeway story. Yeah, you watch it and say, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You joined fresh out of high school, the, the police academy? Uh, I went to uh, Cal State University, Long Beach, uh, for two years. Um, well, I, I ended up graduating, but I became a cop. I thought I was going to be a football player, but that didn't work out too well. And so I started working in the jail at the age of 19, mm -hmm. which is way too young. But I started working as a, a jailer. And then when I graduated from college, Cal State Long Beach, in 88, 89, uh, then I went to the police department, became, went to the police academy in 1990. Okay. And you knew Suge back in high school? Yeah. And, and I mean, high. I've been knowing Suge since elementary. Okay. Day, but what about Keefe D? Never met him until, um, knew of him while I was a cop, but never had any runnings or met Keefe D um, until maybe an incident or two, you know, in Compton. So that would be like 92, 93, something like that. Okay. Knew who he was, knew his mama house and all of that, but no interactions, no arrests or anything like I did with some of the other people. Okay. So you never arrested him? No. Okay. But what was he known as in, in Compton during that time? He was an asshole. Uh, he was Pat Johnson's boy. Um, but Pat Johnson is Pete, him? Uh, Pat Johnson, a guy that, uh, was one that was allegedly uh, supposed to have been shook. Uh, front money, you know, Harry will get the credit, but actually it was Pat Johnson, PJ, uh, that gave up a bunch of money. He, he ended up getting 30 years, but he recently been out about two or three years. Should never give Harry O credit, you know, but David Kenner, who's the attorney, he was also, he was Harry O's attorney, and he was Pat Johnson's attorney. Okay, and, and who, was, who was Pat Johnson? What did he do? He was a big time drug dealer uh, okay. that, like I said, got caught in one of those federal task force, did 30 years. Um, he's been out for about five, about five years now. Since about 2006, 2007, he's been out. Okay. Was he, was he the biggest drug kingpin in Compton? Um, he was big. Uh, Fink was big. Um, uh, that I know of, yeah. Wonderful. I will put him in the top, top five. Okay. Because he, 
allegedly had millions of dollars ready to invest in, in death row in the beginning. I only heard, and she'll only give him credit for about 500000 Still uh, a lot. A lot of money. A lot of that's money. From a guy that's, in, that's doing this from jail. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. And did you deal with him at all? I only met Pat once uh, he got out. Shug and I met with him about 2006, 2007, when he was in bankruptcy, because Shug was trying to get him to come forward to say, hey, hey, Harry O, tell the truth. This, I mean, not Harry O, tell the truth. This nigga Harry O didn't put up no money. You the one to put up the money. You the one should be making a claim and putting a claim in, you know. Well, why didn't he make the claim? He was on federal pro- parole. Yeah. Okay, so he would have to say yeah, this is yeah, drug he, money. Yeah, and, he ain't you know, trying to get, he's not trying he to. moving on with his life. You know, he out. <laughs> Shit, he a nigga just did 18, 19 years. <laughs> okay, so what was Harry O's involvement exactly? He was the broker. Ah. Uh, he, uh, you know, he, he David Kenner was the attorney, and he was the one that was like, um, hey, Pat or whoever, it was a, a couple other guys, I need to invest in this company. I'm about to start, you know. You know, I got rap a lot. You know, he, you know, he tried to take credit for starting helping out Lil J as well. Y'all do the research. And, um, you know, he, I got this company and I got this. You know, he, he the one who gave Denzel his break in Checkmates, the, the uh, play Checkmates and stuff like that. Hmm. So Harry was in the business. He uh, Godfather Entertainment, something like that. Yeah. I think Godfather right. Entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was doing things. In, you know, Harry was big. He was doing this stuff, but... The government found a lot of the money when they came and finally took him down. And man, as I'm learning right now, <laughs> no fucking attorneys kicks your butt when you're going through a case. And you know, they just they just drain you. They drain you. Aha. So this is the real guy that allegedly started Death Row, who funded Death Row. That's what Shug Knights tell me. Told you. Yeah. Okay. And since he did all those years and got out. He wasn't trying to make any claims. Or he was just happy to be out. He was happy to be out. Did you know Mob James back then? Oh, I've been knowing Mob James since him probably fourth grade, me the second grade. Okay. And what was Mob James' stature in the, you know, mid to late 80s? It grew. I mean, none of us was we were just athletes or trying to play, you know, little league sports or, you know, probably wanted until Mob got start blowing up as being the bad guy. And he was always bad, nigga. You know, he got kicked out of Compton Unified School District by the third or the fourth grade, you know, and had to go over to the L.A. School District. So James was always bad, you know, but he didn't start doing gang banging stuff, to my knowledge, until about when he would have been in seventh grade, eighth grade, something like that. Okay. And by the... By the late 80s, early 90s, what was the you know, status between Mob Pyru and, and Southside Crips? Well, Bloods and Crips always have a strong dislike for each other. Um, but they're mainly, their main gangs that they had problems with was Santana Block, Compton Crips, maybe Atlantic Drive. I don't remember any major, major tension between the South and, um, and the Mob. Um, until after Tupac's death, is when it got big um, for for a minute. Uh, so so yeah. Um, well, Southside wasn't a big gang compared to some of the other ones in Compton, right? Correct. Numbers wise. Number wise. Okay. And they had alliances. They 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 were aligned with. Uh, I think it used to go Kelly in Hood and and um, Kelly Park in Hood and uh, South and Atlantic, and then they also were cool with. Uh, where uh, your boy um, BG Knockout was from, uh, they were cool with the Nutty Blocks. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that mainly because of the high schools. When you go to high schools, you just needed to get numbers up for whatever high school you was going to at the time because Compton Unified School District was moving them around. I mean, there used to be times when my brother-in-law, who was from in the hood, uh, neighborhood Compton Crip, his mom was trying to send him to Dominguez, or maybe it was Compton High. And he's like, no, I'm not going there, you know. So I'm just trying to say, you couldn't go to certain schools growing up. And his mom was like, you going to Compton High? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. So Death Row forms. And Suge basically reaches out to Mob James for Correct. muscle. And I interviewed Mob James. Okay. Yeah. So you, know, you helped set up that interview for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, It's a powerful interview. Yeah. So Mob James comes in and starts bringing all the bloods over to death row. 
Okay. You saw all that happening? No. Well, from the street, from a law enforcement point of view, um, but I wasn't involved with death row at that point. Did you know Buntry as well? Oh, shit. Buntry was in my car when he got killed. <laughs> I mean, you know, that was my Denali that I had went and purchased for him oh. to have a car when, you know. I, these are, my grandmother lived two doors away from, from the McDonald's. Every Sunday you go over to your grandmama's house to play. <laughs> I mean, I, these are dudes that I dealt with. I mean, I live three blocks away myself from them. We went to the same school system, I mean. These are dudes I grew up with. <laughs> I mean, how, how is it when you have a family of cops and a family of gangsters interacting with each other? Like, there's no t weird Well, tension? it wasn't like we was interacting with each other. I was always like an, an athlete, you know, playing, you know, playing sports and stuff. And so, the, like I said, you have three, three type of guys that usually grow up in, in, in your area at that time. You had the geeks that everybody stayed with, that this, he's smart, he's going to grow up and be somebody. Game members don't mess with him. You have the athletes who, you know, hey, hey, play football, play basketball, whatever. Game members don't mess with them. And then you have the game members. <laughs> and they kind of fight and deal with each other. It's pretty much how you, how you have it. If, if it kind of cross over, you know, the, the geeks, uh, you know, you, you kind of get, you just don't get no points, what they call, you don't get no points for beating up or messing with the, the geeks. Right. The athletes and the game members that have incidents every now and then, but not often. And so, okay. so you didn't really have any problems. So the law enforcement interacting didn't come until later, which my father was just unique. I mean, uh, really, he was really a unique and before law enforcement, Willie Williams and all of them for the city of LA tried to come and get this community policing. My father grew up in the housing projects, knew most of these people, mamas and stuff. He used to, prior to becoming a law enforcement, he was a basketball coach. You know, at, at, at you know, in the Imperial Course Housing, and used to take kids like, as we know today, AAA ball and stuff like that, to this company, this place called BCI, which was in Arizona. You know, he was taking all the best players, uh, all of that. But but even before that, he was the he was the guy that worked for Edison, that turned your lights off and on. <laughs> and so he knew everybody, because you know, unfortunately, we had problems with you know. <laughs> Keeping up with the bills, everybody was trying to make ends meet. Yeah. And so he knew all of this economic and stuff, and so he knew how to talk to people and deal with people and have relationships with people, parents, or mother, mainly mothers, unfortunately. Well, you could be cool with everyone, but when you're taking someone to jail for potentially... But it's how you take them to jail. It's how you take it. They do just want to be treated with respect. That's what all they were about at first. So when you come to hey, hey, you know, I, I need to holler at you, James. I need to holler at you so and so because this is what's been saying. Okay. Man, he done got so many people that just laid their soul out and he'd be like, I can try to help you. He would be the type of cop to come to to your mama and be like, hey, so and so is wanted for so and so. <laughs> he played the game, he played the race car. The white boys want to kill your son. <laughs> <laughs> they go kill your son. You need to have them call me. Yeah, I'll come and get them. And bring them in. Did you see uh, th that new documentary? Well, the new movie, uh, When They See Us, on Netflix, the no, one I about haven't. the Central Park Five? The Central, no, I haven't. Well, I actually interviewed two of the members of the Central Park Five. Okay. Do, you know, do you know about this story? That's the one with, with Donald Trump, where he took out the ad and all yeah. of that? Yeah, okay. All right. It was basically five black kids, yeah. well, one, one Spanish kid, four, four black kids, mm -hmm. who were running around Central Park and this white woman gets raped. really brutally raped and yeah. beaten almost to death. Okay. You know, permanent brain damage and everything afterwards. And, you know, the police basically hem up these kids and, and essentially trick them into... Confessing. Into confessing yeah. by telling them, you know, just confess and you, you can go home. Yeah. So these, they basically prompted them what to say, the kids confessed, and then they all did massive amounts of prison time. Okay. You know, seven years, ten years, whatever else, and then the real rapist came forward years later and said, "No, it was just me. All his DNA matched up. None yeah. of their DNA ever matched up." But they all got convicted in, in in courts of law. Did you see this type of thing happen in law enforcement? Where look, you got to solve this case, so just you know, manipulate it how you need to do it. Let's get someone locked up, so you know we look better to the community. 
Um, you heard of situations like that? I, I don't know of anybody copping out. I, I, I believe uh, maybe some cops have maybe was overzealous or something like that and maybe um, uh, was really pursuing these people and really put them in jail. Um, but I think it eventually um, got overturned or anything like that. I'm gonna be honest, I believe there's a high percentage of people that's in prison for falsely uh, being accused, but felt and their defense attorney kind of convinced them that, hey, it might be easier to just go ahead and do this five or seven years than to, than to be facing doing life. Yeah, I mean, the way the whole system is set up, I think is fucked up. Like, okay, yeah. look, you're facing 30 years, but plead out to two years. Exactly. And you're thinking like, well, shit, two years. Yeah, I'm facing. 30 years, even though I didn't do it, that, that's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Shug Knight. I know Shug, that's Shug, your, Shug Knight. I know that's your boy. <laughs> my, my boy. Shug Knight, though. Yeah? I don't believe, I, I don't think the man should be in jail for 28 years for that crime. I, I agree. I've said, I've said it on camera lots of times. Oh, I, okay. I, I thought Sugar was going to get off. Well, I saw the interview with you and Big U where he kind of even felt he would be out, in, as he said, a couple of calendars, <laughs> which is like three yeah, or four you, years. You, you was very confident when he said that Suge's about to get out. What do you think about Suge's current situation? I think he got about, he was probably going to do about three more calendars, three, four more calendars at the most. Three more years? At the most. And then get out? Yeah, he'd be home. he'd be home. He'd definitely be home. I mean, he he has a, a good shot based on the situation. Yeah, he'd be home. When, when you look at it, the only thing is is that he's now on his fifteenth lawyer, and I I believe he's, he has a public defendant now. It actually works for you. The public is all he really needs. You know what I mean? You only need to be it, to, to to be found guilty for for murder and for first degree murder. You need to have he can't even be charged with first degree murder. So that manslaughter basically. Yeah, he had to be. He could only he could only be charged with manslaughter. He couldn't even with vehicle manslaughter. So that takes all of the death and life off of it. Okay, so that's not a third strike. No, nah, it would. I mean, he because it see because for him to get the third strike, and they really moving that they really trying to do away with that. But now they bringing other laws back. Um, but I don't think he in place that they're gonna be able to wash him up. Yeah, and that happened right before Shug accepted his plea deal. Exactly, but so you know he had he had to wait out. You know. Life, cause, and I got to beat this case three times. Well, six times, really, because they got yeah. six chances at three different cases. Yep. And I have an L at the end if I lose one of those six times. And now I can't have any visits. I mean, conjugal visits. It's a different, people don't know there's a different type of prison time with an L at the begin, at the end versus having a date. When you don't have to go before the parole board. Oh, yeah, no. I've it's heard still of, hard. No, I've heard of cases of guys getting three to life. Oh, and 20, 20 years later, still there. Still in prison. Three to life. I know a bunch of seven to life. I don't know any yeah. three to life. I know seven to life. Seven to life. 30 years later, they're still yeah. there. Yeah. I interviewed Greg Kading okay. about, about Suge's case. Yeah. And he said the reason why he thinks that Suge accepted the plea deal was because of the witness tampering. Suge's real problems became during the process before trial when he's on the phones and he's using his attorneys to coerce and try to obstruct justice and that was all going to come out in trial and Suge knew that right yeah and so I guess yeah two of his lawyers got caught up in his lawyers and his wife yeah got, got caught in in uh, well the lawyers got caught up in uh, witness tampering I guess right didn't one of them lose their license or something of the sort? as did the wife you know. The wife, well, I guess she sold the tape mm -hmm. to TMZ yeah. and then violated her probation on that. Oh, so all those situations, all that bullshit that... It's all going to come up in trial. Oh. So, you know, and those are new charges. It's compounding an already bad situation. Were those charges against him or against other people? All against the, oh, oh, so he, sure he's should. included yeah. in all that. Absolutely. So had he not done that, he, he could have potentially gotten a much lower plea deal? It had been better for him, yeah. He knew that facing all of, the, all of that stuff was gonna come out in trial, and he's gonna look terrible, and he's probably gonna lose, and you know, you're gonna be able to paint a pretty bad picture of Suge Knight in front of a jury. They did clear, there's something there that, that they hiding. Okay. Because they cleared out the courtroom. They cleared out the courtroom. 
and played something for him. Then when he came back, he was ready to play. Most people don't know that. There was a tape recording of something. Can you say what it was? I don't know. I say most people don't know. I'm one of the ones that don't know, but I know they cleared out the courtroom and played something for well, him. How do you know? Well, I don't heard. You heard? Uh -huh. So they had some sort of well, tape. From, I mean, I heard this from family members. They had yeah. some sort of tape recording on Suge yeah. that made him say, okay, I can't win this case. Correct. And, uh, yeah, and he's currently incarcerated. Well, it took a deal. Took a deal. For 28 years, which I done heard people say 13 years. Hey, you do the math and break down, it's 16 to 17 years. That's how long he's going to do that. He's got, 17. what, about three years in already? Well, you get time and a half. You get a day for a day. Well, I, I, I talked about this, maybe. It depends. It, it's not always, it's not 100%. You don't always get I your day I never heard that, that it wasn't. Okay. I, mean, when I was in law enforcement, it was Okay, fair enough. Day. But things change. I mean, things change. change. I mean, it was only 50% of the time when I was in law enforcement as well. Now there's 85% for violent crimes. So, uh -huh. you know. Oh, so he's not going to get 50%, even though oh, it's no, the state time. 50, no, no. There's violent crimes now, 85%. 85%. That's with the three strike laws. That was one of the things with the people. Okay, so he's going to get out. That's why I always say 16 to 17 years. From now? Or when he, when he took the deal, which was what, six, eight, eight months ago? Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. So. I always, 69, 70 is the age. He's 53 uh, now, 54. So it was around 70, 71 is one. If he don't beat it on appeal, how can you appeal? I never heard, that's the funniest thing. I, I heard his son, I heard people say, oh, he, we, we have an appeal going on. He even fought for appeal, right? That was the one, that's the only thing he asked for. Your Honor, can I still have an appeal? I'm like, how can you have an appeal? When you took a deal, <laughs> I never heard of a deal. With oh, so a you deal. can't appeal when you take a plea. I never heard of that. I mean, I never <laughs> heard of that. But hey, man, hope, hope springs eternal. Yeah, I guess. You know, freeway Ricky beat a life sentence. Yeah, it but happens. He, but he had Maxine Waters going back for him. Oh, that's what happened. Yeah, Maxine Waters went and took him before the uh, the Congress and testified and all of that. Well, yeah, you know, but that was linked to the whole Iran Contra yeah, scandal, yeah, all, and it was Oliver North. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was at the highest levels I of government. Take the field. <laughs> General. Oliver North. You know, before Suge got into death row, he was bodyguarding and he was working for Bobby Brown. Correct. And Bobby Brown had a hit on him. Correct. Was it one hit or multiple hits? Some dudes from LA. Bobby was on that, snorting that stuff and he owed us some drug money to somebody, some street money to somebody. And Suge went and talked to the dudes and, and it went away. No one shook, and Al Heyman, they may even gave him some money. It was, it was like he called and apologized. You know, street dudes got, everybody got gangsters. And if you in the game like that, you got some hitters with you. Okay, and so, well. But that's how the story goes, but. Bobby Brown was one of the biggest stars. Oh, he was big. Of the yeah. 80s. Yeah. My prerogative was like song of the year yeah. and everything. Yeah. So you mean to tell me that he couldn't pay back some, some cocaine money? Like, Bobby Brown was not a drug dealer. He was a drug user. A user. Mm -hmm. So you could only do so much coke. Like, how much can you really owe somebody? 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 maybe at the, if you had some huge party. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'm just saying, like, this is, how could someone just, of Bobby's stature, just not pay it back? Like, okay, boom, here you go. Sometimes people don't want your money back. It's about the respect. Oh, hmm. okay. Sometimes so, you don't uh, diss me enough where... I gotta do this to you. <laughs> you watched this, this, you've been watching American Soul with Soul Train where, where he kind of, they talked about that in there a little bit where I, I can't let you just walk away from this. I can't, mm. I, I gotta do this to keep my okay. reputation and my name right. So should came White in. White man can't jump. They did that. They, right. they laid down and took the pictures and were like, we can't let you get away with this. <laughs> give us some pictures, act like you did. So we, you know. Okay. So should came in and got the hit off of Bobby. It worked it out with the guys. Correct. Okay. And that was with Al Heyman? Well, they were working for Al Heyman Productions at the time. Okay. Al Heyman was the one putting on the uh, the concert. The tour. The tour. That Bobby Brown was headlining. The Scream. Him, I'll be sure they were. That was a big concert for them. Okay. A big tour. So, Suge was basically handling problems for people back then. They're the problem solver. He's the problem solver. Problem solver. He, he's our modern day... Uh, Ray, Ray, uh, Ray Donovan. Ray Donovan. Right. <laughs> I'm Martin Day Ray Donovan. Well, uh, Mob James said that he was with Suge when the whole Vanilla Ice thing happened. Vanilla Ice said that, you know, 
Suge came over and basically. Suge didn't own shit to that. Suge went to him and pretty much punked him out of his shit with chocolate, yeah. saying that he wrote the shit the whole nine. Ice Ice Baby. Yeah, didn't have nothing to do with it. So chocolate had nothing to do with that song? No. He took the contract to Vanilla Ice, made him sign it, and they gave him a check for it. Were you there when that happened? Yeah, I was with you. Okay. And the story that Vanilla Ice said was that Suge took him to the balcony. No, I didn't. I wouldn't nail on that. No, no, I don't remember that. You don't part. remember that. But no. he didn't punk Vanilla Ice. Oh, yeah, he punked him and a lot of people. What? How did he punk him in that situation? Well, basically telling him what he going to do with his arm around him and told him pretty much what you're going to do. You're going to sign this paper and you're going to pay me for this. I believe that. Were you around Suge back then no, or not? No, no, no. Okay. I mean, I knew, I knew him, but I, yeah. I was straight street cop. Then. I mean, Suge was basically known for problem solving. Problem. Even, when, they, even when there weren't real problems. <laughs> well, he was trying to, they were trying to get some money out, out, of, out of him for black, for, you know, chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate. Black. Chocolate, chocolate came to him saying, hey, ooh, really? Oh, okay. This is how you do this. Because Dick Grippy, Shug don't give Dick Grippy enough credit right. for being his mentor. Virgil Roberts. Who I interviewed, yeah. Yeah, Virgil Roberts, good though. Virgil Roberts and Dick Griffey. Virgil Roberts was Dick Griffey's David Kenner. Yeah. Like the show. And um, so he don't get enough credit. So I don't know who ideal it was. But that's what Shug used to always say. Virgil Roberts, I mean not Virgil. Dick always used to say stuff that he wanted to get with his deals with, with Solar Records that he couldn't get. And so he would try to make it impossible and tell him, you need to go and demand this from Interscope. You need to go and demand this. And then he'll get it. And then Griffey would be like, damn, he gave up that? They gave you your masters? <laughs> they did that, you know. And so anyway, I'm sure Dick Griffey is the one that, that uh, told Shug, this is what you need to do. Right. Yeah. And you weren't around during the whole incident at, uh, at Solar, Solar Record Studios no, no, where uh, Suge made those guys strip. They're in the building. We're paying all the bills. We get a phone bill from the studio floor that was something like, I want to say, $8,000 for a month. Okay. So Griffey calls Suge in and he says, look at this bill. This is ridiculous. If you can't get those knuckleheads down there to stop using the phone, I'm going to throw you out. So uh, that night, Suge comes into the building, you know, goes up to the, to the, to the third floor, and one of the Stanley brothers was on the phone. Um, and I wasn't there, so this is what was reported to me, you know, um, that he asked the guy to get off the phone, and he said, and I think the Stanley brothers had been part of the world-class wrecking crew, and... Uh, they were actually there to try and get Dre, who by then is, is becoming known as a, as a hit producer, to do something for them. And so he tells Suge, he didn't know who Suge really was. He said, hey, look, I'm, uh, I'm one of uh, Dre's guests. Go talk to him. And Suge said, I don't talk to him. I run this. And he said, man, go leave me alone. So Suge apparently goes out, goes back downstairs to his car, gets a gun, comes back, puts the gun to his head, and says, motherfucker, I told you to get off the phone. Chuck brings him into the studio and has everybody, you know, people from the rehearsal, I said, I want you all to come in here. And he said, this is what's gonna happen if you use that phone. Uh, and so he tell, tells uh, uh, the guy, take off his clothes. And he says, I'm not taking off my clothes. So then he shoots the gun he has by the guy's ear. I mean, you know, I've heard the story a hundred times, but yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't there. You go and join Death Row Security at one point as the head of Death Row Security. Correct. So then you have you, and you have a crew of cops, basically, off-duty cops. Yes, off-duty or retired. Yeah. Yes. Then you have Bob James and his crew of Pyrus. Correct. Uh, <laughs> James take the credit for. Uh, being the head of the homeboys uh, security, but really his cousins, Ronald and Donald, was the ones that was the bosses of the homeboy security. But they wasn't really, they were big, strong dudes that nobody messed with, but they didn't really claim a gang, you know? Mm -hmm. They were, they lived over in the neighborhood. They lived on the other side of Long Beach Boulevard on a street called K Street. So they didn't really know the dudes like we, you know, like we did, because we didn't grow up on, because we grew up on the other side of the Compton Swap Meet. 
Mm -hmm. And so, but Ronald Knight was really the uh, head of security, but him and Shiv fell out eventually. Well, Mob James said that he used you and your crew to control the Bloods at death row. I even told Lil Reggie, you know, I love you to death, but Shug shouldn't have never brought you to death row. The reason why I saying that is because Lil, Lil Reggie had issues with some of the guys that was working for death row. So when you did that, what was the purpose of Shug doing that? Shug's purpose was to have Reggie there to keep us at a bay. Mm. Because oh, I see what it is. We on his neck. And oh, okay. So he had the Ma Piru dudes as muscle, but then he had Reggie and the police to kind of control that muscle in, in a way. And exactly. It was a balancing act. So oh, okay. I never, that, of, I never thought of it that just way. Just picture all the big homies, all the homies. Right, because everyone in here, every gangster is ultimately scared of the police <laughs> to a certain degree. It, was, it wasn't that. Just say, for instance, you got all these guys out of the penitentiary. These guys really don't know you from jack shit. But they telling you, man, what the fuck do this nigga think he's talking to? Suge couldn't talk to you like that. Suge didn't have the control. The only control Suge had was letting you see what how many numbers on that check. And, oh, that's cool. But, I mean, we had homies fighting each other, stabbing each other over a paycheck or what was going on because of Suge said, now here come Reggie Wright. When he brought Reggie and his security in, Everybody got a woo because Reggie is is moving with Suge like this right. now. And he's the police. Yeah. That eventually had to happen because of the way we came in. Um, uh, we came in because um, they were planning on robbing him. It was some of them that was going to rob him, kidnap him, and hold yeah. him for ransom. And so they, they started having a lot of internal fighting and stuff. So what he means by that is... Um, And it was because of my father. I, I could sit up here and try to pat myself on the back and make They had a lot of respect for the rights, or Reggie Jr. and Reggie Sr. It was for my father. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things they would let go or let happen when they knew we were around and, and they wouldn't do things. Like as soon as it came down, the talk of robbing and kidnapping stopped, where one of the dudes to this day stood up and told you and copped out to it. So yeah, those niggas told me to step back. Rock Chisholm, told, they told him. He said, yeah, they told me to step back. They were about to do this to you. But it ain't going down no more. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. But at one point, the Bloods started fighting each other. That's, yeah, that was a little later. Yeah. You know, even Suge, I think, was probably, no. It started in like 95, 96, but when it really escalated, she was in prison. Okay. But it started to get really bad. Among themselves Among fighting themselves. over positionings and checks and Cars. jealousy and trying to take a car back and minute petty, petty stuff. Well, I think like something like 10 bloods got killed. See, that's why I say it was over a period. Everybody thinks like happened like a, a street war. This is over a period of from 90... 697 to about when Poochie got killed, 2006, 2005, something yeah, like that. Yeah, over 10 years. Yeah, so over a period of time. It's not like it just happened. Mob James's brother, Buntry, gets killed. Yeah. You said it happened in a car that you... I was uh, the registered owner of... You were the owner of that car? Yes. What was the situation over that? Because he said, uh, I mean, he said on camera who he thinks killed him. So the situation with Buntry, you said that George... Killed him? Yeah. And George was a, a Pyru also? Yeah. Okay. He got stabbed? Who? Uh, your brother. No, he was shot nine times. He was shot nine times. I'll say on camera. Shit. Dude's in jail. Name is G. Is it M Monkey Man? Monkey Man. Well, y'all call him Monkey Man. I, we call him G. Monkey Man is something Impo Mines <laughs> came up with and started calling him. Okay. We don't know anybody. If you even say the name Monkey Man, I think you said it in the interview with James, and he was like, who? <laughs> but we call him G, George Williams. Is but, but, yeah, yeah. George, I mean, but that name Monkey Man has been floating around as well. 
Infomines did Inf something. Infomines? Okay, yeah, got it. Okay, so he was the one that killed Buntry. He was one of the ones. Even if you look at the, uh, the composite sketch, you can see the ponytail. Now, we call him Ponytail. That's what was our cold word for him. Like, if you ever heard me and Shug talking, well, he'll say Ponytail because he had a moniker for everybody. But, but yeah. Okay, so why did he kill Buntry? <clears throat> All right. It was this dude, uh, it's this guy named Little Rod, Roderick Reed, and George. Uh, they were doing, they had this boy named uh, Vincent Buchanan, who was V Dog. He got killed in Compton, tortured, dropped off, handcuffed, um, dropped off in, on Central in front of the cemetery. They were real tight with him. He was, you know, a real active, cool, fruit town Paru deal, Vito, Vincent Buchanan. So, the word is that Buntry was watching the tape at his house with um, the torture of it going down. They taped it? That's what the word is. Huh. Buntry and them house have been... And I'm not snitching because, you know, their house done been raided. It's all court paperwork where the FBI and they have been questioned for looking for this, this videotape. Okay. Shug's in prison when this incident happened. 98, 99, I don't know. That's when it happened. Now word is, okay, you know, police kidnapped him. You know, well, guys wear police jackets and stuff like that. He's handcuffed. So who, who's number one suspect when you hear police in Compton handcuff? Reggie Jr. Hmm. Who run and work with Reggie Jr., I mean, and all of that? Shug Knight. Who's the closest person to both of them that's allegedly watching the tape and has a videotape of it? Buntry. So all these dudes is like, okay. So these three niggas had something to do with, uh, with our boy getting killed, Roderick. And who's now G and them, they, in, they got indicted together and doing life in prison, in federal prison, where I'm about to go. <laughs> but doing life in prison, in federal prison, um, together. And um, so... Now they getting word and they, they so they, they mad. They, you know, like thinking this is really true. What people don't know, they came and confront Buntry about this, you know, like a week or two before he got killed. Buntry goes and say, no, man, come on. It's not true about the tape. And we have nothing to do with this. A little bit prior to that, they kill a dude that's, one of the dudes that actually did it, his name is David Brown, in front of Buntry House. That was a message. They followed him over there, killed him, shot his girlfriend. Hmm. And she, she still don't have an arm from that. But killed him in front of Buntry House, sent him a message. Then they come and talk to Buntry. He denies it and all of that. And they call me. Say, Little Ridge, we, you know, you know, we don't believe you had anything to do with this anymore. But we won't. We won't know where Shug live. We, we want to get him. We give you fifty thousand dollars. Like fools. What y'all talking about? Are you still a cop at this point? No, no. Okay, no, you, you've just, already. I'm just, you're gone at this point. Yeah. Ninety nine, two thousand something. Okay. Like that. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? But you're still connected to law enforcement. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're telling an ex cop. All of this, right? That they they want you to join into a murder, basically. Ex, you know. Like, nigga, I'm not mad at that nigga like that. We, you know, we, we against each other. It's like 2002, 2000. But I ain't mad at him. What are y'all talking about? We told y'all we have nothing to do with this bullshit. This is some bullshit, you know. Mm -hmm. Where is it coming from? If Buntry, because we're on the street was Buntry was watching the tape. If Buntry had the tape or watching the tape, we don't know why. But me and Sugar ain't had nothing to do with this. I call Sugar, tell Sugar, hey, these niggas is, you know, Sugar, I ain't worried about those niggas. I ain't had. So everybody's starting to meet and talk and meet with people and all of that. And they had meetings behind it. But they still believe it. 
And um, they've been at the Buntry ever since. And, and they killed Buntry. In your car? In my car. Did they try to somehow tie you into it, or since it is your car? Or, or? Well, the, the stupid conspirators out there, <laughs> these, I don't even want to say their names because people give, start giving them views or something. Yeah. But they'll go and say, Reggie Rice Sr. was in the car, <laughs> and he took off and ran. <laughs> Where did that come from? Because they don't know. Well, I yeah. think Frank Alexander said it, but they get neg- mixed up because the car was registered to Reggie Wright yeah. Jr. So I've been contacted by the FBI, and you know, we all, yeah. all this done been talked about. So stuff I'm talking about, yeah, 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 y- y'all go report it. <laughs> They'll be like, we done heard this stuff in 2003, 2004. Well, when I interviewed Mob James, I mean, he said from his point of view that at one point, you know, Suge, felt like he couldn't control all the various street guys yeah, and he started and when, to and when he talking that's a little earlier okay yeah right so but before that he said the shook started to get guys to turn against each other death row was fighting the homies just clashing at each other like this now because because they were fighting over money over the shit that suge was saying and doing yeah. over over yeah they say the, not just the money now it's okay, you fucking with my homie. This is my dog and now everybody is fighting each other. You know what I'm saying? And when, when I tried to tell them that this, this shit is coming, nobody wanted to listen to me. You know what I'm saying? And then guys started Still getting doing that bullshit. Oh sure. You know, guys started getting busted. They they would find dope in their cars no, and, and since no, yeah. so that's that part's not true. No, 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 and since true. he had police on his payroll, he yeah. can go have a police go and search someone's guys some guy's car, find some dope and then Haul him off to prison. When he brought Reggie and his security in, everybody got a woo because Reggie is is moving with Suge like this right. now. And he's the police. Yeah. So I ain't finna send myself back to prison. See, it was a lot of shady shit going on now. Now you got brothers, they finding the stashes in your car. Everybody that was getting mad at Suge, they find the stash in the car now and he doing five, six years in prison. He he had a way to get rid of the ones that he was really afraid of. That happened one incident with me and this guy by the name of Neckbone, Roger Williams. Neckbone who was part of the MGM fight? Yeah. Okay. In the Live and Die LA. Me and Neckbone in 94 maybe, saw him on a traffic stop on San Vicente. Like, what's up Neck, how you doing? But y'all don't know, as law enforcement, Nick, a good street cop know when somebody dirty. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, oh, this nigga dirty, what's up? And I'm working for Death Row, just doing video shoots and stuff like that, but not really working, but I'm still, you know, doing my job. You're still Compton PD? I'm still Compton. Okay. Order Nick Bone out the car, out of his car, because we like side by side. He gets out of the car, we get in one of the biggest fights ever. I mean, Neckbone and I end, end up like that. and Fist fights? Big fight, yeah. You, you and Neckbone? Me and Neckbone and my partner. Aha. And, and uh, you guys are in uniform and everything? Full police uniform and everything. I guess, uh, he had a bunch of cocaine in his pocket. He goes to jail. Okay. It's the only time I've ever arrested anyone from over there in the hood that was associated with death row. Well, the only incident, so. Um, there's another time with um, a guy named Zeke, we call Glenco Zeke, that had a gun on him and stuff like that, but he, nobody know who he is. <laughs> they never even heard of him. But other than that, I never really arrested any. You know, I arrested some guys for robberies on the tape and stuff like that. But that's the only guy that we know of associated with Death Row that ever got arrested. Well, I mean, according to Mob James, at the end of the day, all these guys that worked for Death Row who put in work who beat people up, who intimidated people, who shook people down, who did everything that Suge wanted them to do, all walked away with nothing. We ain't got one millionaire, we ain't got one thousand dollars, we ain't got not one, not one man prospered from that, not one. Everybody is back where they at. And, and when I say that, a lot of people get me twisted and saying that I'm bitching about what we got paid or where, where we at take your licks. I take my licks. I'm the first one to admit that if 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 I can do this again, I I would I'd get paid. And everybody else would be getting paid. But 
everybody knew what the outcome of this was going to be pretty much because when Suge went to jail, Suge took back everything. He didn't want nobody to drive. He didn't want nobody to live. Oh, so, so all the cars were basically leased under death row? Yeah. And then when he went to jail, he took everyone's cars Park back. Them. That's correct. Suge, Suge as well. And Suge as well. Yeah. I didn't even think about it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you kind of, kind of put a full circle there. You know, Dr. Dr. Dre was the only one that really walked away. And Snoop, Snoop's still a and household Snoop, name. Yeah, that's true. You know, Snoop's still a household name. And, and Dre. Snoop and Dre. Yeah. Yeah, man, it was, it was definitely so much potential that, that we were too young. I had too much money. Too young. Money and power. We were too young. So let's just fast forward. Okay. Before the MGM incident, there was the the Lakewood Mall. Okay. The the Orlando uh, Trayvon Lane incident. Okay. Where Trayvon was wearing a death row chain. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess they tried to take it off of him. It was an attempt, yes. It was an attempt, but I guess Trayvon kept his chain. Correct. Was there a bounty on death row chains? Was that a real thing? We always heard it. Well, it was made up on the West Coast or what, that, you know, this is the reason. We heard it. That's what we felt. You had guys, when they go in certain places, tucking their chains <laughs> that shouldn't have had a chain, which is funny now. This, why are everybody wearing death row chains now? Even Snoop. <laughs> I seen the home game. Game, game, game I has a game. Game. What's up with this now? But anyway, they were scared of wearing them back then. <laughs> but well, I mean, now it's more of a classic kind of yeah. thing. I mean, but Death Row is no longer a real entity. Snoop is Snoop. He don't need to be putting on a chain. But but if anybody could, he could. M. Dre Shook could because they made Death Row. Absolutely. And Pop, without those four, who is Death Row? What is Death Row? I mean, I, I think I remember talking to Trey D about this, about this whole death row chain. Uh, well, I mean, I talked to a couple of people about it. I think I talked to Trey D and I think I talked to BG Knockout about it. Was that a real thing? I don't know. I, I mean, who, who would you turn them into to get to 10,000? Who was, well, well was 10, according to uh, Greg Kading, uh, it was, you know, Puffy had put that that number out there. Can't confirm it. So you would have to fly to New York or what you do? Send Puff your telegram. I got a death row chain. Send me the 10,000. Here's proof of the chain and give a picture of it. How how would you get your 10,000? That's what they say. Well, Puffy was affiliated with the Southside Crips. Okay. Did you know anything about this at all? Never. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Mm Mm-mm. I'd have probably, you know, been looking for a death row chain. <laughs> I mean, if I'd have heard of it, I'd have probably been trying to get that 10000 me and all my homies, I'm sure. So I ain't never heard this before. Was he in prison then? I don't sure. know. BG, 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 my boy. I like BG. I did a few <laughs> interviews with him. But BG in his memory, man. <laughs> well, I mean, and Trey D even said, okay, well, you get a, a chain. Where do you go cash it in? I mean, yeah, who, yeah. Who, who, do, who, do you call, who do you call? Who do you call? <laughs> where, where's, where's the chain delivery yeah, location? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it was out there, but yeah. I mean, but Southside had connections with, I mean, they had Von Zilp, Corey Owens, and all of that that was dealing with people that was associated with, with bad boys. So they could have made the call. But okay. the Southside, could, they knew who to call. They they hung with them. They went to summer jams and yeah. And I mean, Big Gene tell you know stories all the time on this show about them gambling together and shooting dice together. So they knew who to reach out to. So at one point, but well, Puffy did align himself with the Southside Crips. Oh, for sure. That's, that's, okay. And you saw them out together? Oh, I, I, numerous times. Biggie over there. We you know, Compton's a small city. It's an eight mile wide city. Um, so we know girls that done been dating them or seeing them or hanging out with them or seeing them. Mom James, uh, baby mama, uh, his do- daughter of his, you know one of his kids is uh, Pam. She still to this day live over there in the South Side, and uh, you know so Suge and Buntry was messing with Keepy D and <laughs> and them their baby mamas, you know. So uh, everybody knew, everybody knew what was up. You know? Well. I mean, Mob James said that Suge tried to extort Puffy, but Puffy had killers on his side too, so he couldn't do it. Suge was in some shady shit, doing too much, and trying to flex. 
and he couldn't, he didn't have his bodyguards like he normally had. So he was out there thinking people is like really scared of him now. He couldn't take advantage of that this time. Fuffy them went biting into that shit this time. Right. They had their own. Yeah. They, they, he had killers too. Yeah, he had right. people with yeah, the business guys too. like Wolf and, and everything. That was ready to go. I, I, I say this all the time. Where we at? Tarzana, Van Nuys, whatever. It's a motherfucker, Jack Taylor from the Santa's Anarchy out here that you don't mess with. So everybody got killers and gang, you know, tough guy that you just leave alone. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure you got some, I hear of a dude named Gutter or something like that, that Gene always talk about that you don't mess with that was from New York. Uh, his boy Wolf, yeah. you know, so everybody got killers or dudes from him. Shook had him. Shook had a crew. 95, 96. That's why, you know, he fell off in 2000, but 95, 96, he had a crew. Well, there was a run-in that happened at the, the Soul Train Soul Train Music, Music Award. Awards. And Death Row ran into Bad Boy. Correct. And somebody brandished a gun. Me? Well, before you. Oh. I always say it was Keepy D. Keepy D was definitely there. Big Gene corrects me. And say it was a dude named Cutter or Gutter or something like C. that. C. Gutter? C. Gutter. Well, that's that's uh, Puffy's that's or Biggie's, Biggie's cousin. Biggie's cousin who's, who's, a, who's a crip, actually. Okay. Yeah, matter of fact, I just interviewed Chia Lee, who okay. was locked up with C. Gutter. Okay. And he said he was a crip in Rikers. I got stabbed on Rikers Island. You got stabbed? Right. Over what? Some blood crip shit. Okay. C. Gutter. C. Gutter, what up, nigga? <laughs> nigga, C. Gutter, Biggie cousin. Oh, really? Junior Mafia. See, you got to so you you? where you at. No, that's my man. Oh, okay. I got stabbed because of him. Oh, because of him? Yeah, because of him. I mean, that's my bro. That was my bro. You know, but he was he's a he's a crip. Okay. And he's a, um, at the time, he was like a notorious crip. Like, he's a warrior. Like, see, and when, when I was on Rikers Island and in prison, it was predominantly blood. So, those that was in the system at that time that were crip and claiming crip, most of them was pretty tough. Most because most of the Crips would turn Muslim or turn blood or just drop their flag or be Rasta. The Crips that stayed Crip and claim most of them was tough. Like Hollywood, C Gutter, C Gutter was a warrior. Warrior. So he got into an altercation with some bloods. He got into an altercation with some bloods, and because me and him was cool, when the altercation happened, I think they moved him out to a different building, and because me and him was cool, they got at me. Well, well, Big Gene swears that that's who it was that brandished the gun. You remember it being Keefe D? Oh, I remember it being Keefe. Okay. Well, and they could have been side by side. It was two guys. Okay. But I always knew Keefe in my in my head, and like. Okay. Yeah. So he he someone on Puffy's side. Either Keefe or, or C got to pull out a gun. They had a gun. But he didn't point it. He didn't point it. He just pulled it out. He just pulled it out and he kept it down. The Muslims did what they supposed to do us to be in security for for the uh for the vineyard or for mainly probably for, for Don Cornelius for the for the war show. But you know how you have security that's working for the, so the FOI. Yeah, the FOI. Yeah. And they were in the middle, brothers, brothers, brothers and all of that. Puppy ran like a bitch. And I don't care what Gene say. He keeps saying that he had Puffy and Puffy ran and got up underneath the car. Okay. Well, wh why would you pull out a gun in a situation where you know other people are armed you and not actually? Or you no, him? talking about him. Whoever, whether it was well, C C Gutter or or, or Keefe, why why would you pull out a gun knowing other people are armed, and that already will give someone the excuse to, to kill you? That was their job. That was his job. That's why he was with them. That's okay. why he was with Biggie. That's what he was. He wasn't there to be giving them wiping him down or giving him shoes and stuff. He was there for Biggie to feel comfortable and safe to do his job. Okay. Yeah. So one of those guys pulled out a gun. Pulled out the gun. And then you pulled out. I pulled out my gun. And you pointed it I at him? I pointed it. I'm legal. I'm, <laughs> I'm legal than trained. And right. I'm, and you've actually shot people on the job before. Unfortunately. Yeah. So you pulled out and what, you told them to drop their weapon? I was pointing it at him and telling him, don't raise it. That's what I'm telling him, don't raise that gun, dude. He already got it out. I ain't telling him to drop it. I ain't doing police mode. I'm telling him don't raise it. And like I said, the Muslims in, in, in the middle, Pac is telling me, 
he trying to pull the gun from me. <laughs> you know, Pac was wilding out and, and trying to take the gun out of my hand. He, shoot him, Red, shoot him. I'm like, man, Pac, be cool. Bro, Don't please don't raise that. I'm begging him. I'm, I don't want to shoot nobody. I'm not no trained killer. That's what most people think security is, is armed assassins or something. No, I'm not. I am a, a trained, I'm supposed to be a, a witness, a good witness or a you know protector. I'm, I, I can't guarantee your safety, like you're gonna come home or like I would love to, but anybody, whatever security guard will tell you, oh, you ain't going home. I mean, you nothing gonna happen to you, you're full of shit. You, you just try to be the best witness yeah. or protector you can of yeah. that person. Well, you know, I mean, yeah. there was the Snoop situation before where Snoop's bodyguard, Malik, Malik ended up killing somebody Correct. to protect Snoop. Correct. But it could have gone the other way. Could have went the other way. Yeah. And, um, but that's why it cost them four and a half million dollars. On a situation where the jury, <laughs> the jury, said that he was innocent, but legally, it was still like, no, nah, you gonna pay. They paid that man four and a half million dollars. They paid the family? Yeah. Of the, the guy that they, that they killed? Yeah, they paid Four and a half million? Four and a half is what I heard. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so this situation of Soul Train Music Awards, you got your gun out and you're pointing it at Biggie's entourage. Well, at the guy hand, that's holding the gun. Let me correct that. It may have been four and a half million dollars is what everything eventually cost. Calls. Okay. Okay. So you're pointing the gun at Biggie's crew. Crew. And Tupac is trying to grab the gun from you? He yeah, asked Pac. Pac, Pac. Pac was, Pac was about it. <laughs> I mean, we could try to take it away. Pac would, he, he's a, lack of a better word, instigator. Um, I mean, get wild. I mean, he, yeah. What would have happened if Pac grabbed that gun from you? That's what it would happen. He grabbed it and took it. And he, he would have started shooting? in jail. <laughs> and some would say, you know, maybe that would have been best. He'd at least still be alive. But. So what are you doing as Pac is trying to grab the gun from you? I'm just telling Pac, you know, he be cool, you know, like, no, be cool, you know, Pac don't, you know, I'm, I, I had a good grip on the gun and stuff like that. He ain't getting in front of it, taking it and grabbing it, but he, you know, he's hollering, shoot him, Red, shoot him, Red. So Pac is telling you to shoot yeah. at Biggie Scoop. Because the untrained eye or the untrained person believe just because a person has a gun, you can shoot him. Well, and they have a gun out. And some will say law enforcement today believe that. <laughs> that's <not>. Right. <laughs> well, that's not. and I'm sure yeah. Pac was fearing for his own life. That as well. Because he had already gotten shot a bunch of times. So he, he's extra scared to be around guns. Like, and you he, know. And he shot, what, two cops, right? He shot two cops himself. So he, he's been, and, and he had been shot out a bunch of other times. Oh. So there's a bunch of situations that people don't talk about that I know about. At studios and so forth, all so types of things. The thing in Marine City, what? You know. Yeah, the Marine but, City situation. But then there's other situations. Yeah. Is what I'm saying, like literally, just random stories yeah, I hear from yeah. people. I mean, yeah. Pac was around a lot of gunplay, yeah, yeah. a lot. Unfortunately, in the '90s, it, that's what was going on. I mean, I, it's stories that we have never spoken on, <laughs> where it was gunplay and and shootings and, and stuff that's out there. I mean, okay. Unfortunately, I mean, you weren't the only one armed on the death row side. No. How like, we, what is the situation talking about? The, that, soul, tra that, the, soul, the soul Train situation. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, Frank probably had his gun, but he was trying to park the car. I had to jump out of the car right quick. I was on the passenger side. But they were going into a vineyard where there were metal detectors and, and, and people being searched. Um, so I don't think any of the homeboys had guns on them going, trying to go into the, uh, the Shrine Auditorium. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure everybody in their car had something. I'm sure Suge had, we had stash boxes in all the cars. I'm sure Suge had something in the, in the Hummer. Okay. But no one else on death row pulled out a gun? Correct. No one. Okay. What ultimately de-escalated that situation? The Muslims, I'll be honest. They, they calmed it, and then the guy took off and ran. So you got in them, they took off and ran, and uh, ran towards the, uh, to, to the gate, him and Keefe D, you know. And I'm saying names, and other than Keefe, I don't know. The only reason I'm throwing out the name Sea Gutter is because of what I've heard in private conversations between okay. Eugene Dill and myself. Well, and you said that Biggie actually kept his school the whole time. Kept his school. Stood there. Look, me looked like, he was like, what the fuck's going on? Why is these niggas tripping like this? <laughs> That's the impression I got. You talk to the, my, my comedian friend <laughs> at the time, show, he was like, oh, that nigga was too big. He, he, he couldn't run. He couldn't hide. He couldn't do anything. But, but yeah. 
But I, I give him credit. I give him a little more credit. Yeah. To me, looking eye to eye, he looked like a nigga that was like, why are these dudes tripping like this? Yeah. Well, because him and Pac were friends not and too long ago. Understand. Yeah. From what you said before, Pac was not going to go back to jail no matter what. Yeah. Because he was out on bond. He was out on an appeal bond. An appeal bond. But that was going to, it was either, he was either going to overturn the case or he would have to go back to prison. Correct. And I guess he told the outlaws to do something to him if he had to go back. He told, I have overheard conversations between Suge and him where he would say he's going, I don't know if he ever mentioned that to the outlaws, but he said that he was going to have one of the outlaws shoot him in the head. He never said himself he would have one of the outlaws shoot him in the head if he had to go back to prison. It's the, the things I said. Now we say a lot of things in jest. Talking shit, we call it. If he was or wasn't, I can't say, but I have heard that. I mean, based on what you know about Tupac being around him, do you think he really would have had one of his guys shoot him in the head if he had to go back to prison? No, I think he was just talking. Because he kept asking David. It was mainly David Kenner and, and Suge where the conversation been going on. What's going on with my case? What's, what, what's happening? You know, just, y'all just tell me if I got to go back to prison or not. You gotta remember, he was doing songs dissing the correctional facilities, people inside the the jail system, the prison system. He was talking about people that lived on the East Coast. He was saying a lot of stuff that people might not like. <laughs> you know, correction officers, the uh, the um, the dudes that lives out there, and 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 guys inside the prison. Yeah, no, I heard he had a rough time in prison. Like, I heard that, well, he had shot two cops. So all the COs were basically, like, against him. Yeah, I never heard him talk bad about the COs like that. But there were some dudes in there, crews in there that he didn't care for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I had heard, like, they would give him, like, unnecessary cavity searches and all types of other bullshit to, like, fuck with them. Yeah. You know, and they'd be like, oh, there goes the gangster rapper. Yeah. You know, they would just fuck with him. This is why he was so eager to get out when Suge came yeah. around, uh, you know, post Bond. Uh, well, I don't want to put it, that's the only reason. Um, somebody came to me and told me that it was a way that I can extend me staying out of prison or something like yeah. that, or, or that they will hire an attorney to help me that can do this and make some promises and stuff like that. I, uh, and when you wreck a label, I mean, come on, we forget. And Keisha, his, his wife at the time, would tell you, Pac had no money on his books. People would try to say Madonna was doing this and Madonna. People weren't coming through. Yeah. People were com promising things and saying this. People wasn't coming through. Yeah. She even put $15,000 on his books is what made him reach out and call Shug when Shug was just looking out. That's what Shug do for people in prison. Right. Then. But even though Pac had the number one album in the country Man, dear it, mama was on fire me against two the million world. records two million records sold at that time yeah but no money at um, you unrecouped yeah unrecouped yeah you unrecouped yeah where's the publishing money yeah <laughs> you know the Hughes brothers which is crazy to me why is the Tupac estate allowing one of the who's who's huge brothers to do the documentary and they don't want to have him fighting another case in LA yeah he ended up beating up the Hughes brothers so you're, you're with the Hughes brothers shooting this music video. Tupac is there, mm -hmm. and, and no one, at that point, they're not talking to each other? I mean... They, they just drove up, I guess. They was, Pac and them was down at the bottom of the hill shooting dice, kicking it or whatever, and I guess they just drove up, and um, Pac, he told me, he said, man, I told him not to get out the car. What do you mean? You know, like when they drove up, it oh. was like 30 dudes standing outside, and you say, I want to whoop your ass, Right, but it's their video shoot. If you're going to be smart, don't get out the fucking car. But, it, but it's, the, it's their video shoot. Yeah. And so, you know, he told them don't get out the car. Once they got out the car, it was on. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, wasn't too much they could do after that. All, they, all anybody could do was call the police at that point. You know what I'm saying? So, so Tupac jumped on him. Yeah, I wasn't down there. This is what I'm hearing from my friends okay. and, and Pac. You know, okay, you, you didn't actually see it. Yeah, all I, all I seen was... Um, you know, Allen, I think, and he, you know, coming up the hill, and he had blood all over him like the Carrie movie. Oh, so well, he got hit with, like, a, a 
bottle or a brick or something? Or? I don't know, but he was bloody as hell. He was, oh, that, so he was really, this wasn't just a, a couple punches to the face. This was a no, real. Yeah, that was some shit going on. Like an ambulance came and all kind of shit. Oh, shit. So it was bad. Um, yeah. But now the state is in business with him. Yeah, well. Oh, man. I mean, you know, everyone who had a problem on that side is no longer alive. So <laughs> Tom Wally was still around. Tom Wally. Yeah, Tom, Tom Wally, Wally, you know better. People, Tom but... Wally, you know better than that. Okay. You know better than that, Tom Wally. Well, I remember Arian Foster, uh, the, you know, the ex-football player. He has a, a podcast. He interviewed Snoop. Okay. And Snoop talked about the confrontation between Tupac and Nas. We bumped heads at the end. When uh, we was in New York for the um, MTV Awards. and um, oh, That was one of the biggest hip-hop moments of all time. Yeah. And Pac had seen Nas in the park. And him and Nas had words. But Nas didn't want none. But Nas had a hundred niggas with guns. Right. So listen to what I'm telling you. Yeah. By me saying he didn't want none didn't mean he didn't punk out. Mm. It mean he just didn't want to. Go there. All the way there because we was in New York in Central Park with a hundred goons from New York circled us. Pac didn't even see them. I did because I got a gangbang mentality. I seen when niggas start circling and right. putting their hands in their pockets mm. while Pac is in this nigga ear telling him, nigga, I, nigga, I made a song, nigga, dissing you, Jay Z, Biggie, and the nigga, and nigga, and motherfucker. And, and I ain't got no problem with you, Pac. All right, nigga, well, if you ain't got no problems with me, nigga, when this song come out, you better not say a motherfucking word. I love you, Pac. Shook the nigga hand. Damn. That's a real one. That's why I love now. I said it's That's dead. a real one. And Pac walked off to me. He's like, yeah, nigga. And whooped him. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, nigga, you have no idea. No. <laughs> no clue. That's insane. It's the truth. Right. You were yeah, there. Yeah, I heard that bullshit. It was bullshit? Man. Yeah. Why was well, that bullshit? Because. Well, um, you, you were there? I was there. I okay, I, I, so I, I, so, yeah. Tupac could diss Nas already, right? On the album, you talking about on yeah it, against our lives? Yeah, correct. It, it was on the. I mean, it hadn't came out yet, but it had been recorded. Okay. Yeah, but the Machiavelli hadn't came out yet. Okay, but but Tupac had a problem with Nas. They had a problem, but they worked it out that day. Okay, so they ran into each other. We ran into each other. This was where? At at the park that's next door to Radio City Hall. I do a little, uh, on Bomb First, I think some people say Cobra Park. Okay. It was a park. It was a big old park. And that's where you see all the people in there with the Death Row East uh, uh, signs and stuff like that. All of them wearing the Death Row East t-shirts. We had a bunch, you know, most of the people, uh, Mutal and all of their boys and Fatal, they, they had a whole bunch of dudes from New Jersey that was out there. We probably was, Death Row was probably like 20, 20 deep. You know, okay. it was at the MT, it was right after, it was like the after party for the MTV Music Awards. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember seeing Snoop there. Snoop, where were you at on that picture? Well, Snoop saying that Nas had like 100 guys there with guns. They had a bunch. We, we, it was both sides. And it was tension. But they talked like men and worked it out. So Tupac and Nas got together. The two Nas was talking about coming in next, the next week to, to record it. I saw... Pac tells Shug, which um, in fairness to Shug, didn't have time or he went to prison, started having this problem. But he turned to Shug and told him, we're going to take that, that verse off where I just uh, nods on against all odds. Now, it eventually got out. I don't know if it was the people that was running the company at the time, because Shug was in prison when Machiavelli eventually came out. It never got taken out, or we couldn't because, you know, Pac was, you know, five days later got shot and later died. Right, but the two of them actually did work it out. They did talk and ahead of time. Yeah. And the reason why I did Shook Snoop, because he tried to make it seem like they were about ready to kill us and if Nas would have snapped his hands, it would have been a big shootout. Because Fado and, and, and Mutau, they were deep and they had a bunch of dudes from Jersey with them too. And I'm pretty sure they had things in their waist and pockets as well. Okay. And I did as well. So it would have been a, a massacre out would, there. Would have, been, would have been a shootout. It would have been. So I'm glad both of them were man enough to work it out. The Las Vegas incident happened, and Tupac gets killed. Correct. And then the war breaks out in Compton. Correct. Okay. Well, well let's just talk about the, the Vegas incident for a second. Greg Kading said that if, if Suge had cooperated, yeah. 
I think that that had Suge and other members of um, his entourage, you know, if they'd all been forthright and uh, not wanted to take the matter into their own hands and handle it on the streets, uh, yeah, absolutely, Tupac's case should have and could have been resolved really quick. Everybody knew it was Orlando. It was just getting the evidence to support that knowledge. And, uh, you know, Suge Knight could have said, oh yeah, I looked right over. I seen Keefe D in the car. We had eye contact. I've known him since I was a kid. That right there would have made all the difference in the world. Right, because Keefe in his confession to you said that him and Suge locked eyes. Right. And um, he even thought that Suge was dead because right. he saw Suge get hit, you know, grazed in the head. If, if, if she had known, she didn't know. We well, heard, we heard names, we knew street names and stuff like that, but they say they played football when they were young. Sugar is diabetes. Don't, don't y'all see now what's going on? Sugar diabetes was so bad, Sugar can't see past. Sugar couldn't see that far. So when Keefe in that recording said that him and Sugar saw each other in the he car. He probably thought he looked. He didn't know who the hell he was. He didn't know who he was. When, until they put two and two together, they knew who they beat up and all of that. They started putting it together that there were some guys. It was just some dudes from the south side is all they knew. I was the one talking back then. I was the liaison between me and the police. I was the one feeding information. I'm the one that took Edie and, um, and Gaddafi down to Compton Police Department to meet with Las Vegas Police Department, Las Vegas PD to uh, identify. identify. They were going to identify him. Identify who? Baby Lane. Aha. But, but Las Vegas PD didn't do what? Well, but they but, didn't even want to show him the six pack. Well, they but, picked the argument with him. Well, but Edie wasn't there during the fight. Not the fight. We're talking about the shooting. The shooting. They're gonna identify. <laughs> they're gonna identify the shooters. E Edie identified the shooters. They were going to. They were going to look at the six pack. Let me just say that. And then what happened? The Las Vegas PD picked the fight. Picked an argument with him. Wouldn't even show him the six pack. They didn't want to solve that case. They didn't want to deal with that investigation. Those particular cops. I don't know what the cops today are doing or DA today. Right. Well, I mean, I've, I've talked to Greg Kading about it. I mean, Vegas was trying to do this whole family friendly kind at of exactly. at the time. Like, no, bring your whole family, go to Circus Circus, exactly. and, you know, they bring didn't the kids. Want no big trial and no big rap. You right? know, the, yeah. you don't you don't want to shoot out with a bunch of black gangsters Man, on the main the strip. They had fucking water parks and all of that built yeah. on their property at the time. They were trying to make it a family atmosphere. Yeah, they I mean, backfired on them. They yeah. backed down to only high rollers. What happened in Vegas? Stay in Vegas. But back then, back then it was a whole different thing. It was thing. a whole different. Yeah, uh, and for atmosphere. them to start investigating this really would've brutal been. public murder, yeah, would have just fucked up, a, you know, billions of dollars maybe. Yeah. People don't know that the the current mayor was a reserve police officer at the time, Goodman. He was the first one on the scene. And one of the bicycle cops on the scene. And after that happened, they say his hat went from, from reserve police officer to boss, the mayor. <laughs> Essentially, everyone in Compton knew that it was Orlando. Everybody always knew. I mean, well, from the beat down stuff, three or four days later, after people start talking and, you know, we eventually learned about, I didn't know about the beat down until a couple of days later. Um, until we learned about the beat down and the incident inside the, uh, the club, I mean, the, the MGM. And all of that is when um, everybody started putting two and two together. And, and, and when did the first shooting happen in Compton? I'm sure it was two or three days later. Okay. I know it was before Pac died, the shooting started happen, happening. Who was Sergeant Reynolds? Fred Reynolds. He's a, a guy that worked for Compton PD. He wasn't a sergeant at the time, but uh, he, he worked for Defro. He worked for me uh, for a while. Um, and um, yeah. I mean, Keith E.D. referred to him as Compton's dirtiest. Which is untrue, it's unfair, but that's what, we all dirty to crooks. I mean, everybody think cops are bad or, 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 or dirty or, or don't like cops, don't talk to cops, they're always a cop. You, you always, uh, you know, you're always a cop. Once a cop, always a cop, you know, atmosphere. Well, well he said after the shooting, he said Sergeant Reynolds and his crew started raiding the houses of the, of the Southside Crips. It wasn't really, he, number one, he wasn't a sergeant at the time. Uh, but number two, uh, and we're talking about a guy that became, eventually became over the IA or, or internal affairs at, at the sheriff department. <laughs> a guy that, 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 that uh, you know, was in the elite 
when he just retired just recently in the last few months, that was an elite uh, sergeant uh, in, in their homicide di division. And so these are guys that even from, when, from Compton went over to the sheriff's department, had that stigma on them, and still rose up in their department. Okay. So I'm trying to say these are good cops that guys, you know, putting bad jackets on um, that had to, you know, show to a law enforcement of 10, 10,000 that, hey, we know what we're doing. We're good yeah. cops is, is, is what he's talking about. But the reason why, and, and I talked to Fred since then, and he told me, yeah, he said, that, isn't that the red onion did happen? He said, hey, nigga ain't took none of my women or nothing. But, and then he told me, she bought me a car. I mean, I had that car before I started working for you in Death Row, which was a red Acura. So, uh, you know, that's one of the things he talked about, Sergeant Reynolds. But the main thing is he talked about him raiding his house. And he said, yeah, I wouldn't, you know, because he was on, over, a hom he was in a uh, homicide or something. So he said, yeah, but we were just backup. We was Russell Poole's backup. Mm. For LAPD, because when you go in somebody else's jurisdiction, you usually bring a few of their cars and their cops to the house, to the, you know, what you as backup. And he said, all we was was LAPD backup. LAPD, Russell Poole, handled, you know, mm. the search of his, uh, of his house. But, you know, of course, KPD think it was Fred Reynolds that handled, you know, that raided the house. But that was Russell Poole that did that. Well, Keefe said that your dad threatened Keefe about him, about Keefe going after you once the war broke out. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. He, my, I, I didn't believe it when I heard it, but you know, everybody, I'm on social media with everybody. I comment everybody. And some people told me, yeah, he said this about your dad. So I go, Reggie, what you? He said, oh yeah. He said, I went over there. He said, when I heard they were talking about doing this and doing that, I told those niggas, been that nothing, been not having the Reggie Jr. Cause you know, he knew I was running with him. Because if y'all do, y'all going to have some problems. He said, I went over there. He said, but I mainly was looking for Orlando. He said, I didn't know who the hell Keefe D was at, you know, then or, or, or knew him like that at that time. He said, I mainly was coming over there to talk to Orlando and, and to his sister. He said, that's who he think he ended up talking to was his sister or his mom. But yeah, you know, that was an accurate statement I found out. Well, last time you were here, you had a case pending. Correct. Have you been sentenced already? I ain't been sentenced yet. I ain't been sentenced I still, yet. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, I'm still, I'm played out, which I did. Um, I'm sure by the time this air, <laughs> I would have been sentenced because um, I know I have a court date coming up um, at the end of this month. End of this month in June? Yeah. What about your dad? Uh, he has an agreement in place, uh, but he hasn't been sentenced yet as well. We were scheduled to be sentenced on April the 30th, but the judge was in trial, and um, so the court case got continued. Okay. Does it look like your dad's going to get off? Oh, I mean, he, he should have been. He shouldn't even been involved in it. Yeah. But I don't like to speak on it. U.S. attorneys get mad yeah. <laughs> when you speak, but my father should be okay. Okay. What do you I'm think? not. <laughs> but my father if you were to guess, how long do you think you're going to get? Anything under three years. Under three years? Yeah. It's not too bad. I'm not sure. It's from Maryland. Yeah. All right. Whatever. Can you can you say what it was, what you're being sentenced oh, for? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, sales of marijuana and um, money laundering. Okay. A lot of marijuana. Yeah. Good amount. What's going to happen to an ex-cop in prison? Are you going to get put into PC? Well, you go by your points. I have never been convicted of any crime or anything. Okay. I'm not a, in for a violent crime. So I'll be in somebody camp, I'm sure. A camp. A camp. And that's yeah. considered like a low security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. So you're not dealing with like hardcore. No, I'm not going in. If you know, I don't. I don't have a violent crime. It's not a violent crime. Okay. Um, and I don't have any points. It's mainly on the point system, and I've never been in any trouble, or anything, so I don't have any points. Are you worried about someone potentially trying to get at you while yeah. in prison? Um. I mean, you always worry about that, but I don't. I mean, I'm not. I'm not walking around here with no G strain on. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I ain't the toughest guy, but I ain't the, yeah. you know, I'm just a regular dude. Regular people go in and out of there and don't have no problems. Yeah. Why should not? I mean, I have law enforcement things, so they have things in place for law enforcement people and all of that. So, I mean, but okay. I'm a unique brother. 
Bad. I'm unique. I done ran a record company. <laughs> I ain't with gang members, and I and you been a cop. And I was, a, I'm unique, and I never was dirty as a cop. I get a bag, a bad bag of being dirty as a cop, but I, didn't, I wasn't dirty as a cop. Yeah. I have done things since that I am not proud of, but the the the, the reputation that I has perceived. I mean, it's just yeah. some bullshit. You know, last time we talked, you were in contact with Suge. Yeah, well, I have spoken to him once or twice. Since that time, had you spoken to him? I haven't spoken to him personally. I spoke to this guy that I guess was was the Reggie Wright at the time, Rick. I have spoken with Rick uh, a few times. And um, and so, and of course, I still deal with all, let me see, three of his seven baby mamas, <laughs> or six baby mamas. I've talk, spoken with them. Okay. Yeah. How is Shug doing? Uh, he had his surgery on his eyes. Ah. Uh, so he had a surgery. Um, so you can see his, again. Yeah. Uh, his daughter, um, recently, Arian Knight, uh, she visited him in prison and she put on her social media uh, some pictures oh, really? of him and he looked good uh, on her Instagram what, page. What's her, what's her name? Well, she's going to get mad at me saying it, but his daughter, Arian. But, so if y'all can check her social media out, she had some nice pictures that I thought of him and her together. He's in prison in San, in San Diego, and uh, I don't know if she's since taken him down, but I know after her visit, she... Here we go. She, yeah, look good. Yeah, yeah, she does look pretty good. Yeah. Looks like he's Looks dying his beard. Way. He's actually, you know, good, yeah. how do you get hair dye, beard dye in prison? Well, hey, I guess we should sure not. I'll tell you in about three years. <laughs> yeah, this, this was actually taken April 21st. Yeah. There's a picture of them two together. Yeah. He looks healthier. He looks good, don't he? Picked up his weight back and... That's all I said. Shug was just, everybody wanted to make him out to be weak and this and that. He was just... Playing the game. Get, no, no, he wasn't playing the game. He, he, well, remember he was he self came out. He was No, that nigga was sick, man. Okay. He self, and y'all and, uh, and, and added a lot of that stuff to it. You know, with the, the blind stick and the blind man stick. And social media, y'all, y'all motherfucker. But, you know, he's getting the shots right, I'm sure. He getting, you know, he's getting his body taken care of right to fight the diabetes that he has. Well, I mean, people think I have some sort of yeah, you're thing against Shug or whatever game, else. But, it's cool. but at the end of the day, man, like I have so much respect for what Shug yeah. helped put together. Yeah. yeah, you know, some of the finest music ever created. I agree. Timeless still, music. Still, you can listen to a Pac album now. Pac album, Snoop, Snoop album, album, Dre album, yeah, whatever. Yeah, still. You know, the chronic was under his watch. Doggy style was under together, his man. watch. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? Man, I don't know why we can't. You know, it'd be unfortunate, but we got the the holograms now. We can put Nate Dog yeah. and, and Tupac. You know, yeah, and and to me, it's it's not that I, I dislike Sugar or anything of that sort. It's like yo, like there was so much potential there, and even after Death Row folded, like people wanted to work with Sugar. He's such an an interesting figure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That, well, that, a guy you interview a lot and defends him, um, Nick Cannon. If Suge was just that cool dude with the death row stories, he could have gotten reality shows, he could have gotten he various tried. deals. And he came stuff. to me. He wanted me to produce some stuff. Okay, how did that go? <laughs> Suge is my man. Like, I was into, to me, what I told Suge. But you didn't do the deal. No, no. What I told Suge, and this was kind of right before all of the, the drama happened, because okay. we, we was talking, uh, we talk all the time. Um, I told him, and this is what I tell a lot of my guys, Write it down. This is what I told I told Freeway the same thing. Like, I was like, you have the greatest stories. You've never been able to tell your side of the story. Mm -hmm. Forget the reality show. They just gonna mistreat you and produce you the right way. I know straight out of Compton is out, but no one knows Suge's story from Suge's point of view. And I told him that I even talked to him while he was inside. I told him the same thing. I was like, yo, you in there writing? Well, they're, they're dry. I mean, by the time this comes out, the the documentary on Showtime, the Antoine Fuqua. Yeah. Uh, you know, did on show is, yeah. is, is out. Right. You know what I mean? I can't wait to see it. Me either. But that's what I'm saying. Like, but I told like the value in the written word, as we all know, but like from his point of view, like some of the stuff, like, first of all, Suge is one of the greatest storytellers in the world. I don't know if people, if you ever get a chance to just uh, talk to him, however, over the phone or whatever, when he tells stories, like he would be telling me stories about the Easy E days, like, be, like before they had beef, like when that was his partner, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like, all of it, like his stories of just playing football, like his stories of just like this kid from Compton who just wanted to be the best, wanted to do security, wanted, and then ended up running a, a hip hop empire 
It's a tremendous story that we haven't been told. And then, then I, I want, he's the greatest villain in hip hop ever. And, and, yeah. and I know that's your boy, and he, he, he exactly. seems to speak highly of it. And I know they've been communicating. They've been communicating. They've, they've been communicating. You know, and the thing to me is that, like, Shug had so much potential, and there's so much stuff that he could do. Yeah. And, um, you know, he just didn't utilize that potential, and he tried to, to stick to that same tough guy persona. And he could have been, he could have been a but multimillionaire. That's when, that's, when that's all you know, that's all you know. Yeah. And that's where he messed up at. He... And I'm I'm gonna pat myself on the back now because I'm cocky now, but David Kenner, I'm yeah. gonna be honest, and that's who I, I give credit <laughs> to Shug for teaching me the game and all of that. But what well, Shug was good too, you know, as far as dealing with marketing and stuff like that. But David Kenner, man, David Kenner took care of that company and took mm. care of him and and, and 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 gave us a lot of good advice and even. When I was told not to talk to him and communicate with him about business stuff, only thing just let him concentrate on getting me out of the prison and stuff like that, I would still make calls to David and like, how how would you deal with this situation, David? Chug is telling me to do this. But how would you deal with yeah. Jimmy and Brian Turner with with this? Yeah, and we'll, and we'll always be right on to the advice he gave me. Well, listen, and man. he stopped listening to David, and then eventually uh, me, who yeah. was still piggybacking off of David. Well, well, listen, I, I hope Suge does his time, gets out, and learns from his past mistakes, and potentially could have a good run, you know, in his final years. 70 years old? Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I just interviewed Bill. I like to see him do some movies and do some yeah. stuff afterwards. I just interviewed Bill. Because he, he's clear of name. That nigga don't, his bills is better than mine now. <laughs> he right. has no bills. No and, bills. And, and, and what Tina Turner say? Still got my name. Right. And, and go, listen, yeah. I, I interviewed Bill Duke, who's in his 70s, who's okay. still doing movies, still producing movies. You could still yeah, do a lot of very cool life, stuff huh? yeah. in your 70s. And well, uh, My dad's 72, so. Yeah, man. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So I hope that he does his time. I hope he learns from his time. I hope he stays healthy. It looks like he is healthy based on that yeah, picture that yeah, you showed yeah, me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, shout out to him and his family. Yeah. Um, you know? Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because they be on you about it. That's okay. I look at the conversation. That, they be okay. like, you hate Shug. And I be no, like, not, not I don't in the least. Hate well, just, I, never, I, never I, wa I never wanted to associate myself with him okay. based, on, uh, based on his reputation. But there's yeah. also lots of other people I don't associate with based on gotcha. their reputation. Yeah. You know? That doesn't mean that he might not have a good you know, relationship with someone else. You know? And, and one thing that Shug said that I found very interesting, there was a, uh, a jailhouse interview that he did with somebody. Broomfield. Possibly. Nick Broomfield. And he said, I don't worry about my enemies. I no. worry about oh. my friends. No, that was GMX. Yeah. He was throwing a diss at me. Because <laughs> GMX was kept dagging and all of that. And he was telling me, hey, this is the guy that hates Reggie and all of that. Well, well no. I mean, he was talking about, he was talking about, you got to worry about your friends. Because yeah, his friends was the one that took him to that yeah. movie set. And, you know. No, listen to it again. He was talking about me because the guy he? asked him about, they called me pork butt is what he the guy on the thing called said, because I, I told you earlier he has a, a nickname or a moniker for, for everyone. Okay. And that was the one that he called me when he was dissing me. And, um, and that guy said, oh, this guy right here don't like this particular guy talking about me. And, and that's when he made that. He would never speak on me publicly negative, negatively. Yeah. Never. But he threw that little scenario in and talking okay. about But that was J-Mix. J well, listen, yeah. Reggie Wright Jr., thank you for so much, you know, for coming through. Um, Gangster Chronicles. Gangster Podcast. Chronicles. And you coming on, Vlad, you owe me. I me got and Mob you. James, let me know when you're available, man. We do it every Wednesday. Let's do it. I'm down. Okay. Appreciate Peace. that.